Okay, Beowulf and his men have returned to Geatland after their adventure in Denmark. We're starting on line 1914. The harbor guard came hurrying out to the rolling water. He had watched the offing long and hard on the lookout for those friends. With the anchor cables, he moored their craft right where it had beached in case a backwash might catch the hull and carry it away. Then he ordered the prince's uh, treasure trove to be carried ashore. It was a short step from there to where Hrethel's son and heir Higelac, the gold giver, makes his home on a secure cliff in the company of retainers. The building was magnificent, the king majestic, ensconced in his hall, and although Higgin, his queen, was young, a few short years at court, her mind was thoughtful and her manners sure. Harith's daughter behaved generously and stinted nothing when she distributed bounty to the Geats. Okay, here comes another side story. Great Queen Madreth perpetrated terrible wrongs. If any retainer ever made bold to look in her face, if an eye, not her lord, stared at her directly during daylight, the outcome was sealed. He was bound in hand-tightened shackles, racked, tortured, until doom was announced, death by the sword. Slash of blade, blood gush, and death qualms in an evil display. Even a queen, outstanding in beauty, must not overstep like that. So they even have warning stories about women who don't act right. This one is about Queen Madrith. A queen should weave peace, not punish the innocent, with loss of life for imagined insults. But Hemming's kinsmen put a halt to her ways, and drinkers round the table had another tale. She was less of a bane to people's lives, less cruel-minded, after she was married, to the brave Offa, a bride arrayed in her gold finery, given away by a caring father, ferried to her young prince over dim seas. Okay, so for you anti-misogynists, um, or for you feminists there, this is another example of but the, the poem slaying feminism. Like, Queen Madrith was a mean person until she got married to the right guy, and the right guy was able to change her and make her into a good person. So way to go, Prince Offa. All right, that was sarcasm. Sorry, I'm not supposed to use that. Okay. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bum. Okay. In days to come, she would grace the throne and grow famous for her good deeds and conduct and conduct of life. Her high devotion to the hero king, who was the best king, it has been said, between the two seas of anywhere else on the face of the earth. Offa was honored far and wide for his generous ways. His fighting spirit and his far-seeing defense of his homeland, from him there sprang Aomer, which is a name from J.R.R. Tolkien, by the way. Garmin's grandson, kinsman of Hemming, his warrior's mainstay and master of the field. Okay, away from the digression, now back to the story. Heroic Beowulf and his band of men crossed the wide strand, striding along the sandy foreshore. The sun shone. The world's candle, that's the sun, warmed them from the south as they hastened to where, as they had heard, the young king, Angintiao's killer, and his people's protector was dispensing rings inside his bawn. Beowulf, Beowulf's return was reported to Higelac as soon as possible. News that the captain was now in the, dis the enclosure, his battle brother back from the fray, alive and well, walking back to the hall, room was quickly made on the king's orders, and the troops filed across the cleared floor. 
After Higelac had offered greetings to his loyal thane in lofty speech, he and his kinsman, that hale survivor, sat face to face. Hereth's daughter moved about the mead jug in her hand, taking care of the company, filling the cups that warriors held out. Then Higelac began to put courteous questions to his old comrade in the high hall. He hankered to know every tale the sea geats had to tell. How did you fare on your foreign voyage, dear Beowulf, when you abruptly decided to sail away across the salt water and fight at Herod? Did you help Hrothgar much in the end? Could you ease the prince of his well-known troubles? Your undertaking cast my spirits down. I dreaded the outcome of your expedition, and pleaded with you long and hard to leave the killer bee. Let the South Danes settle their own blood feud with Grendel. So God be thanked, I am granted the sight of you, safe and sound. That's not how Higelac actually sounds, it's just my interpretation. Alright, Beowulf, son of Ecthio, spoke. What happened? Uh, now, okay, this next part is interesting because, yes, we've already read everything that happened to Beowulf while he was in Denmark. But we haven't heard his perspective. He's going to retell the whole story, but he's going to add details that we didn't know about before. And he's going to talk about it in a way that the original storyteller did not tell it. So this is actually kind of interesting. All right, Beowulf, son of Ecthio, spoke. What happened, Lord Higelac, is hardly a secret any more among men in this world. Myself and Grendel coming to grips on the very spot where he visited destruction on the victory shieldings and violated life and limb. Loses I avenged, so no earthly offspring of Grendel need ever boast of that bout ever, uh, before dawn. No matter no, no matter no long, no matter no long, that's awful. No matter no long, the last of his evil family survives. When I first landed, I hastened to the ring hall and saluted Hrothgar. Once he had discovered why I had come, the son of Halfdane sent me immediately to sit with his own sons on the bench. It was a happy gathering. In my whole life, I have never seen mead enjoyed more in any hall on earth. Sometimes the queen herself appeared, peace pledged between nations, to hearten the young ones and hand out a torque to a warrior, then take her place. Sometimes Hrothgar's daughter distributed ale to older ranks in order on the benches. I heard the company call her Freyaru as she made her rounds, presenting men with the gem-studded bowl, young bride-to-be to the gracious Ingeld in her gold-rimmed attire. The friend of the shieldings favors her betrothal. The guardian of the kingdom sees good in it and hope this woman will heal old wounds and grievous feuds. Again, we have an, um, an instance in which a woman's value is in her ability to marry her off to create a peace between tribes. Okay, but, but Beowulf is not all that uh, optimistic about this situation. But generally, the spear is prompt to retaliate when a prince is killed no matter how admirable the bride may be. Quote, Think how the Hithabards will be bound to feel their lord Ingeld and his loyal thanes when he walks in with that woman to the feast. Danes are at the table, being entertained, or honored guests in glittering regalia, burnished ringmail that was their host's birthright, looted with the Hithabards, could no longer wield their weapons and the shield clash when they went down with their beloved comrades and forfeited their lives then an old spearman will speak while they are drinking having glimpsed some heirloom that brings alive memories of the massacre his mood will darken and heart stricken in the stress of his emotion he will begin to test a young man's temper and stir up trouble starting like this <clears throat> now my friend don't you recognize your father's sword, his favorite weapon, then one he wore when he went out in his war mask 
to face the Danes on that final day? After Weathergeld died and his men were doomed, the Shieldings quickly took the field. And now here's the son of one or other of those same killers coming through our hall, overbearing us, mouthing boasts, and rigged in armor that by right is yours, and so keeps on, recalling and accusing, working things up with bitter words, until one of the ladies' retainers lies spattered in blood, split open on his father's account. The killer knows the lie of the land and escaped with his life. Then on both sides the oath-bound lords will break the peace, a passionate hate will build up an ingeld, and love for his bride will falter in him as the feud rankles. I therefore suspect the good faith of the Heathabards, the truth of their friendship, and the trustworthiness of their alliance with the Danes. Okay, this whole passage that I just read kind of shows Beowulf's attitude towards marriage. He thinks if the wrong tribe marries their daughter off to the wrong other tribe, then it's not necessarily going to bring break, uh, peace. Like, it's very possible that, let's say the Danes used to fight with the Heathabards, but then they want to make things right, so they, so he sent, so Rothgar sends his daughter to the Heathabards to be married, but she is going to be a reminder to the Heathabards of what the Danes used to do to the Heathabards. And that's just going to make them angry. And they're going to want to like start another fight. He makes a really good point there. Um, if you would like to do research on whether or not Beowulf was a member of the He-Man Woman Haters Club, that is fine. Um, we don't know if Beowulf ever gets married. We know he never has children, so this might be a good subject of research. All right, now for the account of his slaying of Grendel. Also, there's going to be some prob some differences in his story uh, than the one that we've been told so far. But now, my lord, I shall carry on with my account of Grendel, the whole story of everything that happened in the hand-to-hand -hand fight. After Heaven's Jim, that's the sun, had gone mildly to earth, that maddened spirit, the terror of those twilights, came to attack us, where we stood guard, still safe inside the hall. Their deadly violence came down on Hansio. We finally know the name of the guy who died by being eaten by Grendel. Okay. And he fell as fate ordained, the first to perish, rigged out for the combat. A comrade from our ranks, had come to grief in Grendel's maw. He ate up the entire body. There was blood on his teeth. He was bloated and furious, all roused up, yet still unready to leave the hall empty-handed. Renowned for his might, he matched himself against me, wildly reaching. He had his roomy pouch, a strange accoutrement, intricately strung and hung at the steady, a rare patchwork of devilishly fitting dragon skins. Oh, Grendel had a purse made out of dragon skins. I had done him no wrong, yet the raging demon wanted to cram me and many another into this bag, but it was not to be once I got to my feet in a blind fury. It would take me too long to tell how I repaid the terror of the land for every life he took. And so one credit for you, my king, and for all your people. And although he got away to enjoy life's sweetness for a while longer, his right hand stayed behind him in Harrod. Evidence of his miserable overthrow as he dived into murk on the mere bottom. It seems like um, the word hand and the word arm in Old English might be the same thing. I'll keep reading. I got lavish rewards for the Lord of the Danes. For my part in the battle, beaten gold and much else. Once morning came and we took our places at the banquet table, there was singing and excitement. An old reciter, a carrier of stories, recalled the early days. At times, some hero made the timbered harp tremble with sweetness. I've seen translations where it's not some hero who played the harp, but Hrothgar himself who played the harp. Anyway. 
or related true and tragic happenings, at times the king gave the proper turn to some fantastic tale, or a battle-scarred veteran, bowed with age, would begin to remember the martial deeds of his youth and prime and be overcome as the past welled up in his wintry heart. We, are, we were happy there the whole day long, and enjoyed our time until another night descended upon us. Then suddenly the vehement mother avenged her son and wreaked destruction. Death had robbed her. Geats had slain Grendel. So his ghastly dom struck back and with barefaced defiance laid a man low. Thus life departed from the sage Ausher, an elder wise in council. But afterwards, on the morning following, the Dane could not turn the dead body nor lay the remains of the man they loved on his funeral pyre. She had fled with the corpse and taken refuge beneath torrents of the mountain. It was a hard blow for Hrothgar to bear, harder than any he had undergone before, and so the heart-sore king beseeched me in your royal name to take my chances under water, to win glory and prove my worth. He promised me rewards, hence, as is well known, I went to my encounter with the terror-monger at the bottom of the tarn. For a while it was hand-to-hand -hand between us. Then blood went curdling along the currents, and I beheaded Grendel's mother in the hall with a mighty sword. I barely managed to escape with my life. My time had not yet come. But Halfdane's heir, the shelter of those earls, again endowed me with gifts in abundance. Thus the king acted with due custom. I was paid and recompensed completely, given full measure of the freedom to choose from Hrothgar's treasures by Hrothgar himself. These, King Higelac, I am happy to present to you as gifts. It is still upon your grace that all favor depends. I have few kinsmen who are close, my king, except for your kind self. Then he ordered the boar-framed standard to be brought, the battled topping helmet, the mail shirt gray as hoarfrost, and the precious war sword, and proceeded with his speech when Hrothgar presented this war gear to me. Oh, he's talking. This is Beowulf talking. Here. When Hrothgar presented this war gear to me, he instructed my lord to give you some account of why it signifies his special favor. He said it had belonged to his older brother, King Hiraragar, who had long kept it but that Hiraragar had never bequeathed it to his son Hiraragard, that worthy Skion, loyal as he was. Enjoy it well. I heard four horses were handed over next. Beowulf bestowed four bay steeds to go with the armor, swift gallopers all alike. So ought a kinsman act. Instead of plotting and planning in secret to bring people to grief, or conspiring to arrange the death of comrades, the warrior king was uncle to Beowulf, and honored by his nephew. Each was concerned for the other's good. I heard he presented Higgid with a gorget, a pr the priceless torque that the prince's daughter, Wealtheo, had given him, and three horses, supple creatures, brilliantly saddled. The bright necklace would be luminous on Higgid's breast. Thus Beowulf bore himself with valor. He was formidable, in battle yet behaved with honor, and took no advantage, never cut down a comrade who was drunk, except Unferth, kept his temper, and warrior that he was, watched and controlled his god sent strength and his outstanding natural powers. He had been poorly regarded for a long time, was taken by the Geats for less than he was worth, and their lord, too, had never much esteemed him in the mead hall. They firmly believed that he lacked force, that the prince was a weakling, yet presently every affront to his deserving was reversed. Oh my goodness, this is huge. Okay, when Beowulf was young, people thought that he was weak and was never going to amount to much. But through hard work and perseverance, he became the hero that he is now. So this is this is huge. This is kind of like, uh, I don't know, Shil Shefson, who came from nothing and then like made himself into somebody. 
Beowulf, even though he was related to the king, wasn't much thought of. But he eventually, like, proved himself. Right? The battle-famed king, bulwark of his earls, ordered a gold-chased heirloom of Hrathels to be brought in. It was the best example of a gem-studded sword in the Geat treasurer. treasury. This he laid on Beowulf's lap, and then rewarded him with land as well. Seven thousand hides, and a hall and a throne, both owned land by birth in that country. Ancestral ground, but the greater right and sway were inherited by the higher born. Okay, a hide of land in Anglo-Saxon times uh, meant 60 to 120 old acres, which is approximately 30 modern acres, or 120,000 square meters, depending on the quality of land. So, when Higelac gives 7,000 hides of land to Beowulf, he's giving him 200 and 10,000 acres of land just for going 418 miles and slaying a couple of monsters. 